Dasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I hope everybody is adjusting fairly well. The heat is turning up where I am daily and it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay, so um, the first thing you might notice something behind me, I thought I would leave it there for a minute before I switch it. Uh, the problem is <laughs> I took a picture of this Buddha. I had this Buddha made, first of all. I had this Buddha made in Sri Lanka and the Buddha has a very interesting story. It caused quite a stir. You can probably see why it caused such a stir. Can you see the hands? You see these hands on the Buddha? Now, right. So the whole thing about this Buddha is that we were getting sort of aggravated. Bhante and I, we were getting sort of aggravated by the fact that we knew that these Buddhas used to be made and did exist, but that over time, they stopped making them. When we were in Indonesia, um, various places, many pl places where we would go to look at Buddhas and things, we would talk to the generation that's producing Buddhas now. Did your, did your father ever do this? We'd question the father. Oh yes, we did it, but you know, it wasn't a prominent thing. It left and it disappeared. And so now it's very unusual to go into uh, an antique shop or something on the west coast of the United States, there were tons and tons of, of uh, antique shops with Buddhist uh, um, relics, uh, just everything in them, just every everything you can imagine in there. And there were Bud there were Buddhists turning up every once in a while, that old ones that had their hands like this. But it was very very unusual. And the question I always had was why, <laughs> you know, because if we go in Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, the Buddha is very, very clearly in the section on the Nidana Vaga, uh, where the uh, section where the 86, you know, uh, suttas are for the dependent origination, very, very clear about how it should be taught and how it should not be taught. And it should not be taught in the direction of suffering. It should be taught in the direction of the cessation of suffering. He makes quite an issue of this in many of the suttas that the a gift that the Buddha produced or for, of course, is Nibbana. But you know, a lot of people who aren't Buddhists will look at that and say, okay, so let me get this clear. You're in a religion now where to get free from suffering, you just die and you're free from it. And I would stand there and I, at first I didn't know what to say. You know, I had a lot of learning to do, but I was perplexed because they had come to the conclusion that the, the super mundane Nibbana is off the wheel, you're gone, you're never coming back. So good, let's die. What's different from Christianity? If I die, I'm gonna to go to heaven. So I, I, you know, at first I didn't have a lot of comeback on this. I had to spend a few years really working this through to figure out how to answer these questions, you see. But it becomes obvious if you really start to look more closely at the texts, uh, that the Nibbana is an experience of the opening of the mind and there are mundane Nibbanas connected with the uh, attainments. And there is the path, by the way, there is when we say you have reached path, we usually mean you have reached path for Sotapanna, but there's path for Sakadagami, path for, Sod for Anagami and path for Arahat, you understand? So reaching path does not necessarily mean you're, you're you're on path for arahat. That would mean that you are, uh, you know, anagami with fruition, and you're on path for arahat. You see, if you're on arahat. You're on path for arahat and fruition. Okay, so it's kind of never stops until it reaches the end. So when when you look at these things and you sort them all out, they get more and more fascinating. But the most important thing, I'm I'm in the process of trying to decide right now what to do. I finished this one book and we're working on getting it ready for printing. Now, the question is whether I should take the old writings that were almost complete books and struggle with um, you know, editing them and updating my opinions throughout because some of them were written in 2005, 2006, 2007. 
or should I go to something new and, and attack that? And the first thing, of course, is all the research that hasn't been put together for the hindrance book is sitting there. That could be it. But the gnawing thing in my mind is um, what exactly did I witness for the last 20 years? What exactly, and being maybe almost 72, it's time to look at this, you know, what exactly have I been doing witnessing and supporting the, the development of this thing for 20 years by following Bonte around, helping him for transport, helping him for traveling, helping him with everything and, and following the development, the, the, the development very carefully of the terminology and how did all of this happen? If we want to look at what he did, how he figured this out, Initially, we can all go and we can see a video. You can listen to, um, what is it, uh, Fit Mind, uh, number 67 talk, which is excellent, fitmind.com. And that's an excellent one where he really lays it out and tells you what happened, how he got to where he was in his mind. But the real question is how, um, the terminology happen and when you um we want to talk to someone who has been doing meditation in other traditions or in other pa other paths of meditation what exactly has happened is that we are trying to do this at the same time as politically correct speech came into being so what does that have to do with it well the problem here is before that happened, there was brainstorming in the Western world and it was marvelous. It was a genius thing. You just thought off the top of your head. No one took offense at anything that was said. It was not permissible in the plan. And you simply just talked and people took notes and wonderful things were discovered and things that ideas that people had were put together and wonderful things came out of this. And you know what? before I closed my human resources company, that had almost virtually disappeared. And it happened because of politically correct speech and it happened because of the word criticism. Now criticism was uh, hurt a lot of people growing up because there was too much criticism and criticism of that sort is not a good thing. The problem with this is, is the naivete people have of believing that if we abandon dangerous criticism that's harmful, we should also abandon constructive criticism in the arts and architecture and development and engineering or anything else. And we should get rid of critical analysis, which we use for development of industry and development of almost anything. And when I look at this, what are we doing? when we are talking about TWIM, we're not criticizing anyone. But what happened with political correctness that no one talked about was it's going to change how people decide to hear things when they have conversations. And so people become critical and flippantly make and assume terrible assumptions without really finding out what a person means when they listen to you. Therefore, communication has had a huge breakdown along with the development of politically correct speech. So what happened to us was that by even talking about the difference between effort and effort, people decided we were criticizing what they had heard or what they're doing or what they'd read about before without even considering why we were doing this and what they didn't understand anymore, why we're doing it is because we've lost something in Buddhism. The one thing that we see systematically in the text is this was easy to understand, immediately effective for the person in life. So interesting, it invited deeper inspection. And it was something that happens here and now and you can actually see the difference and you can understand how it helps your life. We didn't need the text. Um, 
you know, some people say, well, I don't follow the text and you're talking a lot about the text. I was trying to explain the other day, the simple fact that there are a lot of people now who are serious meditators who want to know where things are coming from in the texts. That's why I give you so much information as much as I can about where things are coming from. But the first year I practiced with Bonte, I was not permitted to read at all. It was part of the deal. If you are really saying you want to understand this, I will train you was the deal. One of the first things that happens is all books you have have to be put in a box and put in the house, not away from where you are. And that meant everything. That meant novels or um, writing, reading, writing a lot. I was allowed to write notes and I was allowed to um, use the computer to type them into SK notes, Sister Kama's notes. But I wasn't allowed to even have a uh, Majima Nikaya on site where I was to fish through the text and everything and examine things that way. Little did I know that he was running his own experiment to see what would happen if he taught someone auditorily just to listen to the Dhamma talks and see if they could understand the practice and start to use it and possibly even make it function. It's cute. <laughs> we joke about it now, but back then I didn't pick up on that. I didn't until a couple years later. And then it all came out. I was allowed my books after the first year. And that's when the work really started. And the work, what I'm talking about after seeing what this practice could actually do and where it could go in about one or two year period. Then all of a sudden, we, he was starting to look at something. He was starting to look at the uh, people listening to him teach. And he was starting to um, notice that if he stuck with certain terminology, he was changing it. That's where he really started to change terminology. But he didn't change the words to a different meaning. There were five thesauruses involved in this different ones, the Oxford, the Webster, there's all a whole set of them at the bookstore. There were a whole the, the, the sources. And of course, this is my buddy. You probably saw this if you were at a retreat, who's always with me to try to figure out if you need another word, we have to give you a word you're going to understand and remember. We're not trying to give you a word that for the bigger grade that we need because we need larger words when we talk to you. That's not what it's about. We're trying to give you smaller words so you can remember. So the original chart of the dependent origination, there was nothing complicated in it. We didn't throw you over into the elements or mention anything about that. We just wanted to have you basically understand those links. And that was precious because that was, the, and one of the things about what happened to right effort, and we go back to that. First, let's look at this. This is the cessation of suffering. What I'm pointing to is his, is the fingers of the Buddha. This Buddha was made and it was supposed to be white and a little bit larger than it is. And it's not that big. It looks big here, but it's only two feet. It was the first one and the last one so far, but that doesn't mean I'm still not gonna do it. I want to start a flow of these Buddhas with a very nice Buddha and having the fingers this way. And the reason is because the Buddha taught suffering and the cessation of suffering. So we can put one like this next to it and we can have one like this. As a matter of fact, we can have one. We can have one like this because we can find those, but we need one like this more than anything. And then path usually happens like this or it can be like that, but usually like this. And the position of the hand this way is the teaching Buddha with all four noble truths, okay? So this right effort issue is a critical thing because if you understand dependent origination and you understand how, I mean, I just spent two days reading a really great meditation center in Burma, their whole book about the instructions and wondering um, I'm beginning to understand why they're not turning out so to panas and sakadagamis and anagamis and things like that. Very, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty easy to see what's happening here. Um, 
And the reason it, it tapped into me, it all goes back to right effort because they talk a lot in this, in this one, uh, in this, this is like, there's a Mahasi Hans handbook and there's a number, there's a number of others. And then there are teachers from Mahasi Sayadaw and then there's teachers from other groups that are teaching the same way. And if you look at them, they're really harp on effort, effort, determination, and all of that and perseverance and then they use a lot of the words about how the in, in either insinuating or telling you, you must subdue this, you must suppress this, you must stop it. And they even use the terminology of these things have to be gotten rid of. And it's so much the opposite of what we're showing you that the, the, real, the real progress that happens is only happening because we're backing off and we're not going to do anything. And they, when you, when you hear, um, uh, let's see, a person would note the odor from the nose and the good smell would create greed. Oops, smelling something doesn't create greed, does it? So if you understand dependent origination enough, the, ten, the, the seven links that I give you to understand, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, and then the habitual tendencies, and then the birth of this reaction that you've chosen to react, okay, which would be the greed, the, the greed carrying through, but is the mix up here, I'm beginning to see what happened because if the psychologists all went to these books, and they were reading these books, it's probably one of the reasons that it helped them decide that feeling is emotion. And feeling being emotion is a contradiction in the line of human cognition. Because first we know a feeling happens. Now, let's be fair with at least most of the books that I was given to, to work with this. Most of these books are coming from before the time when they were doing any kind of uh, cognitive psychology or neurocognitive science. And I'm exposed to the results of the summaries of the research for these things. And it's very clear that a feeling is not an emotion. They didn't have that material. They didn't. So they were coming from another angle and um, pushing through the idea that when the feeling's there, the emotion is there immediately. So the other thing is labeling volition as always being comic. Comic volition is an unfair thing because we're not totally driven in this life. And you can sit and think about this and figure it out for yourself by something pushing us from before this lifetime. You watch it for a while, watch it for a month or you know, two weeks or a month and note what's going on. You can't, this happened in the 60s, by the way. Uh, in the 60s, everything was because of karma. And it went so far that if you saw a person hit by a car, you wouldn't go and help them because after all, it's just their karma. And this was happening in, in California, in all parts of the, the country with karma. And karma was uh, with karma and karma, the same word, okay? One is Sanskrit, the karma, one is Pali, the kama, okay? But passing it off as, well, it's just their karma. Well, here's the problem with that. If something, if someone's hurt or they fall down and you don't stop and pick them up, well, it's your karma that you didn't, it, it's, your, it's your merit lost that you didn't stop and pick up that person. And the other thing about it, my grandmother used to pump into us when I was young is if you don't stop when there's an accident, if you have an accident, no one's gonna stop for you. <laughs> no one's gonna stop for you. In my lifetime, I've stopped at 16 accidents. And they've all been in different types of situations. I've either been the first one on site or it's been on a road where no one else was there and a truck had flipped over with a man and his son in it. 
and he, they weren't out of the truck yet. And there was no one around, no immediate farmhouses and he, they needed help. But there are other situations where a person gets pushed off uh, the road into a gutter and um, with another car just leaving the site or um, another one also is um, the case of uh, someone cutting in front of a car speeding at uh, 60 miles an hour and that car turns like this and hits a, a rump a hump in the road and flies up in the air and comes down on the southbound traffic this was northbound on the south and hits a car on top kills the driver and the woman's pinned in the car and the car's on fire you know these are just things i get myself into uh never been a hassle moment the the ambulance and the police get there what happened what did you see what did you do okay fine get in your car and go that's the way it works in the united states with um um good Samaritan rules. But we were drummed when we were young that if we didn't stop and help someone down the line, it was going to be that we would need help and they wouldn't stop and help us. And that's really seems to be true in my life anyway. I don't know what's happened with you guys. Um, you hear this one here. If a meditator hears a sound and he notices this is hearing, and he says to himself, it's hearing, hearing, by noting this, uh, thus greed and anger cannot enter through the ears. If the meditator, um, by, by, by noticing that this is sound, the greed and the anger can't enter through the ears is what he's saying. Well, that's only true if you understand how the whole thing actually works. So it can be very confusing to someone who, if they're sitting there saying this to you, um, that as long as you stop and pay attention to hearing what the sound is, uh, then the greed and anger can't happen. It's not exactly that way, is it? So when you, you fool around with the six parts of the dependent origination, you begin to understand there's more to it than this. If the meditator, it, uh, ignores noting the pleasant sound, it will cause attachment and the attachment to the sound will create greed. Once again, it's not exactly telling you how this all works. And the preceding parts in the book didn't tell me anything about the dependent origination to get clear how this is actually working because the sound hits the ear and here consciousness arises, the beating of the three is contact, fasa, mm -hmm. with the fasa as condition, way did not arises as pleasant, painful, or neutral. In this case, maybe it was painful, okay? And then um, with feeling as condition, craving happens. So I don't like it has to happen. So there it is. And when we really see the chart of dependent origination, we can begin to reduce craving and clinging by simply understanding that is a volitional point for me to choose to say an opinion there. If I see in the chart, this is, this is a place where the first personal opinion happens. So blaming the sound itself, the sound is innocent. And what we're taught from the very beginning is that of all the six sense doors, I think we're after the same thing, by the way. We're after the same teaching and understanding. What happens with your sense doors is merely what happens with your sense doors and is to be taken as this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. Let's just say it's a sound and let it go. What do we know about the sound? We know that the sound is impermanent, right? And it's only suffering if I get involved in it. And from my point of view, even this, you know, um, paying attention to it in any way is a step away from believing practicing this is not me this is not mine this is not myself now you you all need to comment to me privately or you need to comment to me 
uh, from any place, any angle you want. You can you can come in my room and talk to me about it, or you can you can ask questions about it beyond this spot. Okay, but the thing about this is. Um, we need to keep the right effort going all the time. So coming back to right effort, in this whole book, I cannot find the right effort going beyond the point of labor. In other words, it's always about the first definition of effort, which is working hard. And I think I did it with my, I think I, I, cir I circled it here in this book because I always go back. Somebody says, well, show me what you mean. Okay, well, effort, you see, first of all, shows up as exertion, force, power, energy, work, muscle, application, labor, striving, endeavoring, toiling, struggling, straining, stress, and travail. That's the first definition. Okay, elbow grease. Okay, but the next one is attempt, try, endeavor. Um, okay try and endeavor. Uh, and the third one is achievement, accomplishment, attainment, result, creation, production. Okay, those two, and this one only has two. I've been in the sources that have more definitions than this, but okay, those two, you would attempt to keep right effort going. Just attempt to keep the steps of right effort going. And it's a strange thing. It's a very strange thing what happened to this. How did it get so lost and caught in the first definition? Why? Because almost all the charts that you and I can find in a Buddhist store with the 37 requisites of enlightenment on it say four steps of right effort. And then they don't show what they are, but in a list form, it always shows up this way. So where did the four steps go? The four steps come out of 19, which is the Dwayda Vitaka Sutta first. And you don't see the steps, but what you find in the Dwayda Vitaka Sutta is you find him talking in the front part of that Sutta. You find him talking about what he did when he was still a bodhisattva, that's before he's enlightenment. And he says, it occurred to me, suppose I divide my thoughts into two classes. Do you remember that? Okay. And then I set on one side, the thoughts of sensual desire and thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side, the thoughts of renunciation of, of um, renunciation and the thoughts of non ill will and the thoughts of non cruelty. So right here, he's setting up two sides. And then he tests it. And he figures out that if he goes to one side and stays there, you can see him doing this as an experiment. It leads to his affliction, to others' afflictions, the affliction of both, it up, and the big part is it obstructs wisdom, obstructs his ability to understand the dependent origination, causes difficulties, leads away from the path that would lead to Nibbana, the ability to get to Nibbana. And he says, this is, this is not right, you know, because it leads away from Nibbana. And as soon as he realized that it leads away, it's he starts to let go of that. Whenever you a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it from that point on, removed it and did away with it, which simply means let it go, relax, smile and come back, all right? We know that's what he's doing. The second part, was he looked at this in terms of ill will, a thought of cruelty. And when those things came up, it caused a problem. And then he looks at the last one, sensual desire. And then he turns it all around and he changes. He also points out in this sutta one very important thing 
very important. He says in section eight of this Dwaita Vitaka Sutta, with he notices that excessive thinking and pondering, excessive thinking and pondering might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from productive concentration. I always say productive in front of the word concentration. Because we know he went through and he couldn't have done it with absorption because absorption would have been taking him to a trance state, totally removed from the world, removed from everything, but totally unable to discover what he needed to discover. So he says, my mind should not be strained. That's where he determines this. To too much thinking causes exhaustion, slows us down, keeps us from getting to the entrance of path. When the mind is strained, it is far from its productive concentration. So I steadied my mind internally, I quieted it, I brought it to singleness and concentrated it. Now, if you're obsessing with the understanding that an object has to be there and you're, you're concentrating on an object, why I'm saying it that way? Why am I saying it that way? Um, it's understanding the purpose of an object being careful to understand the, the purpose and function of an object. We've said this before. If we think the object has an answer in it, we're in trouble. I don't care what the object is. Because what we really need to be seeing the whole program was to understand the arising and the passing away of all phenomena and the impersonal nature of this arising and passing away of the um, all the phenomena. So from this whole thing, he what he comes out with at the end, he's saying to the monks, whatever you frequently think and ponder on, that will become the inclination of your mind. So what I see happening is when a person is thinking that the answer is on the outside, or the inside, well, let's see, on the outside, concerning the body. If we're concentrating on the outside feelings that occur on the body outside from like sound and smell, taste, seeing, on, the, on, on touching, you know, for the uh, tactile things, okay. That's not, that's not the answer. And so I think what has happened with Twim is that has gone to the next coach and the next coach chose to go to the mind. And the reason he went to the mind and let all of this, all of this understanding that happens here on the outside or in the internal parts of your body, which are tremendously difficult to watch that, but you can do that if you want to. But it's the fixation on watching what happens on the internal parts and organs of your body, okay, is not the answer. It's the, it's the mind. How do we know this? Let's go to the Dhammapada, first one. <laughs> um, mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are those. So everything is coming from the mind first before even the sight can occur, the hearing, the, the odors, the taste, the body, everything. These are the things we walk through when we're, we're going to Dhamma talks and we were walking through them the next day and trying to put it all together as we're working. We were doing this and we were doing it coinciding with working. I think it was a very healthy thing in those days. Of course, there was a lot to do in those days. There was initially about 30 acres that had to be uh, large areas cleared for building the Dhamma Hall and spaces for building the kudis and all 
the trees being taken down in certain areas to clear the roads and protect the roads from falling trees, just everything. And the roads had to be built and the culverts had to be built so the drainage wouldn't wipe the road away. Everything had to be built. There was plenty of physical work to do back then. And so listening to Dhamma talks, getting up, sitting early, then going out and working and doing things. Now you go there <laughs> and you get to do actual retreats where you go to bed at night, you get up at five, you go 5.30 to the Dhamma hall, you sit and then you do your precepts and your refuges. And then you sit together until just before seven, you go up and eat your breakfast. You have chores for maybe an hour, which are just simple things like just little things that need to happen. We don't pay maintenance people. We don't charge almost anything except to cover electricity or, um, you know, really it's just electricity and water that have to be covered. There's not much charge at all at Damasuka. And so that's where that goes. All right, so now how much did the, did the um, middle length discourses talk about this subject of right effort. Well, I came up with five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17 references that took me into right effort. So what, what he was doing, he took you into seeing, making an effort to abandon wrong view and pick up right view. Now, the thing about right effort that coincides with the neurocognitive research and the neuroplasticity and how you change a behavior pattern from an old one to a new one. It coincides because you let go of the old pattern, relax your mind, pick up the new pattern and you repeat it again and again until mind is not hearing you try to use the old one, only the new one, and then it starts to change. And then your mind picks up and then it goes automatic and it will start living that new pattern of behavior. This is the, the old, new, the new old stuff that's coming <laughs> in, neuro, in neuroscience. I think one of them is gonna get a, a big a, award this year. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, the Buddha should have had something, you know? <laughs> but he was the one, the like the father of neurocognitive science to me. And he was the one who was basically into neuroplasticity long before they named it that. And, but we didn't look inside the brain and see the, the, the reality of this, but he knew it worked and he actually pushed right effort. So right effort sits, where does it sit in things? It, in the eightfold path, it's in the last three pieces. So six, seven, and eight, those three pieces have to do with right effort, with right mindfulness, right concentration, okay? The effort are the steps and we have and the functionality. This is the thing about fooling around with trying to figure out how this works or what happened to it, is that when we start looking at it, we just can't, we can't see it. We have to practice it and try to play with it and see how it's actually working. So what is he asking us to do? Direct knowledge. He's, he was asking you for direct knowledge. Without direct knowledge, no one can tell you how to change a habit and have it happen. You can sit in a psychologist's office or a, um, a psychiatrist's office or anything. They can't fix you. They can give you the steps to go and fix yourself but you have to do it to actually have the results. And this is what he knew back then. So in the first one is 117.9. And if we go there, what he's really talking about is making, makes effort to abandon the wrong view and to pick up the right view. And 117 is called the great 40 and it's going over quite a lot of information. And when you go to nine, it's pretty obvious what he's doing. 
one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view and this is one's right effort well there you are he tells you flat out there you are that's right effort mindfully one abandons wrong view mindfully one enters upon the and bides in right view and this is one's right mindfulness so he's attaching the right view which is understanding everything is impersonal now if we don't get that for a definition of right view the perspective of everything you do when you go into your training is going to slow you way down because you're going to think you still have something great to do that you're going to make something happen that you're going to create something to work in this meditation and all of that put it away and see it was it should be the investigation of the mind just the invest playing with the investigation of your mind when somebody yells at you at what point do you get up tight and you want to say something back let it go the moment you feel the arising of the tension and tightness start smiling and forgiving and letting it go and always remember something and this is important in some of the relationships i'm trying to help right now you have to remember whatever the person is saying to you is actually not about you if they're saying it at you very likely they're talking about themselves and this becomes obvious if you were to document it or just keep recording it and everything and just keep a record of it that way if you played it back you would hear the perfect description of that person the problems they're having in life how much they are discouraged with themselves or even hate themselves and blame themselves and it gets thrown out in your face and you can't even figure out where it's coming from it's an old American Indian thing, you know, the Indians believed that you should never get upset if someone yells at you. You should watch very carefully and be very quiet and see whether that's who that person is and hang out for a while and see if that's really who they are, what they said to you. So this was an old traditional thing that exists in a lot of places. So it says here that one makes an effort to abandon wrong view, which would be taking everything personally and enter upon right view, which would be taking everything impersonally. And this is one's right effort. Then mindfully one abandons wrong view, mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. And this is one's right mindfulness, one's observation of how this works and getting it, watching it. Thus, these three states run in a circle around right view, okay? And that is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, which would be the harmonious perspective, harmonious practice, and harmonious observation. Perfect, perfect works next one is 141 at 29 141 at 29 section 29 141 in 141 is the sachivibanga sutta it's the exposition of truths and you go to section 29 this one reveals a lot of things and when it gets to right effort, it has the specific instructions right there in the sutta in this one. Absolutely perfectly. One awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen evil unwholesome states. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and he strives. So here, you know, he strives simply means you do it, you do it. It doesn't mean you work real hard. You need this, you have the steps, you just carry out the steps. The next one was for the, the uh, enthusiasm is for the abandoning and uh, striving. And then the next one is he awakens the enthusiasm for bringing up un unarisen wholesome states, bringing up what you need that are wholesome. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And then he um, 
he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance. Now, this is the best part. The fourth step, once you have experienced the smile and how it feels, you want to keep practicing, bringing up other states that feel the same way. He awakens uh, enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance, the strengthening, the increase, the fulfillment by development of the arisen wholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. This is called the proper right effort, okay? That's a really good picture of it, that one. 149, section 10, you're only going to find that this is on a, it's in one of the lists. It appears in the list. Any place that the 37 requisites of uh, enlightenment or 36 aids to awakening, any place that they appear, this, this is going to be there, okay? Right effort. Next one, you go, now, this one is uh, when we look at right effort, we have to look at both right effort and also look up right striving. You have to look both places. Now, one thing we found out about this that I really confirmed and I didn't really see it for many, a long time. Um, I thought we're just picking different words, but we've pretty much established that when you're practicing right effort, you're learning these four steps and you're thinking, I have to do this and this and this and this, okay? When it goes automatic in your mind and start doing it yourself, it becomes right striving. That's the automatic point, okay? So the automatic point for this is the uh, um, right striving. What it means is now you're striving properly and you don't have to think about these four steps anymore. So it, this is your six R's or your five R's as I say, because the last one is repeat, but um, the six pieces, they happen automatically and you're not thinking about doing them anymore. So this is exciting. They called that right striving. So when we look up right striving, it does have some different listings. There is another word for it too. I didn't put the poly words in here, but there is another word for striving. First one is 16. Chapter, uh, I'm sorry, suit to number 16, and you go to section 26. 16 and 26. And we did um, the Chitakila Sutta. Okay. And we're doing 26, section 26. Now, what this is doing in 26, it is showing you how to establish the spiritual powers. And the striving, determined striving, is the four steps of right effort inside this paragraph. So to develop, consistently develop the concentration due to enthusiasm, it happens through determined striving, continually using the six R's. Six R, six R, six R, six R. It takes you all the way to path, all the way to Nibbana. And this is confirming that. Go to 70 in section 23. 70 in section 23. Okay. Now, what this is, this section at 23 is a reflection, an echo, if you want to call it that, of 95, the 12 steps in 95 that are given. That's the Chanki Sutta. How final knowledge achieved, how is final knowledge achieved by gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress? Here, one has faith in the teacher, visits him. When he visits him, he pays respect to him. When he pays respect to him, he gives ear, means you listen carefully. One who gives ear hears the Dhamma. 
and having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it. He examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. When he examines them, and their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of the teaching. When he has gained a reflective acceptance of the teachings, then enthusiasm springs up in him. And when enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his will. He keeps going, he keeps practicing is what it means. He doesn't stop. And having applied his will, he scrutinizes. Having scrutinized, he strives. There's the striving. That's right effort. Resolutely striving, he realizes with the body, the supreme truth, and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. And that's where your understanding, your dependent origination. I was having fun with this one day when I was doing this. Um, No, it doesn't. Die. But I stumbled. I don't know where it was. I stumbled. It's my problem. You know, whenever you find something really good in the text, you always need to write it down and put it in a little box or keep it in place where you can go find it again. Because if you forget to write it down, you're going to forget to tell you where it comes. But I found notes one day that pointed to the fact that wisdom is pointing to dependent origination. I was collecting them. I'm not sure if I can find that list now or, or not, but it was really quite interesting that I stumbled on that. Okay, now we go to um, 77, go to 77, section 16. And this one has the, um, specific instructions again. So you make effort to follow these four steps correctly. You will arouse energy to keep the practice going and you will uh, exert your mind means to remember what to do and strive to do it correctly. And this is the instructions for right striving which are identical throughout the text with wherever it says right effort, the instructions are a, a reflection, the same exact ones. Okay, now jump to 95, section 22. 95 in section 22. Okay. And that's just doing this again. It's, it's showing you um, what you found in Chonky, one continuous step in the Chonky list in 95. And striving is the 12th piece. Striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. If one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. That is why striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. So if we don't know what right effort is anymore, how can we get to the final arrival at truth is the question, unless we know what those four steps are and we're using them all the time. Now you go to 101, 101 section 23. Section 23. And how is exertion fruitful? How is striving fruitful? One who is not overwhelmed with suffering does not overwhelm himself with suffering. He does not give up the pleasure that accords with the Dhamma. So there must be pleasure that accords with the Dhamma. Ah, smiling. Yeah, okay. And there is also feeling good, having pleasant feeling or painful feeling is both in accords with the, uh, with the Dhamma and pleasant feeling, as long as you know, it will always arise, be there and pass away. It's not dangerous if you understand Anicca. And yet he is not infatuated with that pleasure. There you go. It's, he's not infatuated with the pleasure that arises and accord with the Dhamma. 
because he's not infatuated with the pleasure. It's that's the difference. He knows when I strive with determination, this particular source of suffering will fade away in me because of the determined striving, the continuation of practicing right effort. And when I look on with equanimity, this particular source of suffering will fade away in me while I develop equanimity. There you go. He strives with determination in regards to that particular source of suffering, which fades away in him because of that determined striving, determining, determined practice of the four steps of right effort. And he does, he develops equanimity in regards to that particular source of suffering, which fades away in him because he's developing equanimity. And then when he he strives with determination, such and such a source of suffering will fade away in him because of that determined striving. So his striving, his right, everything is fading away because of the striving is the point here. And you have to know what it really means. It doesn't mean push hard. And it might, it's true, you go through a, a, a retreat, you feel great. And you go home and everything comes back the way it was. Why? Because you weren't practicing the striving the right way. And you were trying to make the abandonment or whatever it is they're talking about to happen, but you weren't supposed to be there. When he looks on with equanimity, such and such a source of suffering, it will fade away in him while he develops his equanimity and thus the suffering is ex becomes exhausted in him. Does it, it doesn't uh, arise anymore because you've been replacing it. Now, if you are just throwing that away in this whole paragraph, if you take a look at this paragraph yourself and rewrite it without striving, and if you see that, you know, he just simply was throwing it away and think about the other kind of instructions, then you would never stop it. You would only stop it during the retreat and it would probably stay away, maybe, maybe. But if you were replacing it every time, you would be retraining your mind. The beauty of the four steps of right effort, is that it is a purification on the first two steps and it is a retraining of the mind on the second two steps. And that's neuroplasticity. In a, in a nutshell, that's neuroplasticity. You're going to change your brain. Okay, right striving. In 44 section in regards to right striving, right effort, in regards to right striving, um, at 44, section 12, it's just going to show up in a list. And then in 77, 16, which we already came up on the other note, it's going to be a set of precise instructions. Now we get to one that's interesting. In 78, in section 10, 78, in section 10, there is something that's excellent. I said so. <laughs> My notes, I said it was excellent. Okay. In 78, in section 10, what are unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil livelihood or wrong livelihood, unsupporting lifestyle. I would like to say it that way. They are called the unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from your mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied and of different aspects, there is mind affected by lust, by hate, by delusion. Unwholesome mind states originate from this. Delusion means you're taking everything personally. So the person is deluded if they continue to do the bad behavior and they never change. They're deluded. They're not understanding how mind works. And where do these unwholesome habits cease? Without remainder. The cessation is stated here. A meditator abandons bodily misconduct and develops good bodily conduct, develops, he abandons verbal misconduct, develops good verbal conduct. 
he abandons mental misconduct. He develops good mental conduct. He abandons unwholesome lifestyle and he gains a living by setting up a wholesome lifestyle. And the livelihood is inside that when I say it that way. It is here that unwholesome habits cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of his unwholesome habits? Are you ready? Here, um, a student abandoned, awakens zeal for the non-arising of the unarisen, evil unwholesome state. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. Exerting your mind to do what? Exerting your mind to do the four steps, uh, the six steps of right effort, four steps or six R's. And he strives, he strives, he keeps continuing doing that. He awakens enthusiasm for abandoning the arisen evil and wholesome states, or he, and then he awakens the enthusiasm for arising of unarisen wholesome states, or, and then he awakens the enthusiasm for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. And he makes this effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. One so practicing practices the way for the cessation of his unwholesome habits. There it is right there. How can I change? I should hang it on the door. <laughs> when you first come in, you can read it. That's how you change. You have to do it. It's not something you can have me do for you or anybody can do it for someone else. It's all a case of, of uh, practicing the way of the cessation of the unwholesome habits, which is to practice your striving, right striving. So that one is really excellent. You should circle that one because it really puts it out right there. The old habit, the new habit, how to do it exactly. The questions and the answers are there. So that one is, is 78, section 10. That's what we call the divine one. Okay. On 103, section 3, the 37 aids uh, for awakening or the 37 enlightenment factors showing up and it's listed there. And then 104.5, got me, I'm not sure what I meant by that. It says there's no, um, wait a minute, no disagreement about 37 eights. One, 104 section five, let's go there. Um, okay. This is where he's putting the four right kinds of striving inside the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And it's a discussion that he's having with Ananda in a situation where the monks are disagreeing with each other. He's trying to make it clear how you're supposed to work things out. I'll read it to you. What do you think, Ananda? These things that I have taught you after directly knowing them, that is the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, the four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors, the noble eightfold path. Do you see, Ananda, even two monks, who make differing assertions about these things. No, venerable sir, they should be in accord. I do not see even two monks who make differing assertions about these things. So this was actually, this section is largely a discussion about how, um, how at the time the Buddha was there and it was, shortly after he was he's making this clear to Ananda that the monks should never disagree on these 37 requisites. So we've reached a time, this is what I deduce from this, 
we have reached a time where either they disagree on what's happened with right to effort or they think they're saying it the right way. And I, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to English as a second language. But the problem is even when I'm dealing with people who are interpreting for me and I'm in, 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 with an interpreter talking to older monks and things where they're very, very educated and they're, you're, you're believing these are high, high level monks and they're saying this uh, without the four steps, that's disturbing. We have reached a point where we, in, in contradiction with this point is the reason that I put uh, this note in here. There should be no contradiction in how we all, all the traditions, all the schools, everything together, discuss these 37 pieces is what the Buddha is saying here. But venerable sir, there are people who live differential towards the blessed one who might, when he has been gone, create or dispute in the Sangha about livelihood and about the Padimokha. There are disputes and there are disagreements now. We're living in that time. Such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss and harm and suffering of both gods and humans. And then a dispute about livelihood or about the Padimokha would be trifling, Ananda, compared to, uh, but should, to this. But should a dispute arise within the Sangha, about the path or the way. Such a dispute would be for the harm and happiness of many, for the loss and harm and suffering of gods and humans. That's what he's explaining to Ananda. It's more serious than a disagreement on livelihood or the Padimokha to start disagreeing about the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And when you are disagreeing about what right effort was, you are in this bracket because this is where it's breaking down. So that's where we find the most evidence in this one of the breakdown. We could mark that one with a highlighter, okay. And then that's on 104, section five was that one. There should be no disagreement. And then in 118, in section 13, um, and this is interesting because that sits right in the Anapanasati. So inside the Anapanasati Sutta in section, I think it's 15, no, thir maybe 13. Right, 13. In the Sangha, there are monks who abide devoted to the development of the, of the four foundations of mindfulness. And such monks are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. And in the Sangha, there are bhikkhus who, are, who abide devoted to the development of the four right kinds of striving. And the, it, this goes on for each one of the pieces of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. There are monasteries that were dedicated to one piece of it. So we know that happened at some point where they were, that was the main core issue for them as their practice. And the hope was this would never break down, but it does get broken down. That's the part about it that um, we, need to, we need to watch. That's kind of what happened to it. And 149, section 10, What's to be done with serenity and insight yoked uh, evenly together? Okay. In 149, section 10, once again, it's talking about what should be done. But this right striving shows up just inside it. It's where it shows up inside the list, so to speak. But this is where it is also noted that when you go and look at 149, you have to listen very carefully to that because it's important. It goes through the view of a person such as this is right view, his attention is right intention, his effort is right effort, his mindfulness is right mindfulness, his concentration is right concentration or productive concentration. 
but his bodily action, his verbal action, his livelihood has already been well purified. Now be very careful of that statement. Bonte always points this out to me. It's not in the texts. It's coming from the Vasudhimaga and it's passing by um, the, the fact that the eightfold path had eight folds that have to be functioning together. And sometimes you hear this and say, well, that we've already got that. And they then because we've already um, purified our bodily action, verbal action, and our livelihood, we've got that out of the way. So now we can look at this. It has to all be balanced together. Okay. And when we go through all the parts of the 37 requisites, at the end of it, the seven enlightenment factors also come into fulfillment in him by development. And these two things, the serenity and insight occur in him yoked evenly together. He fully understands by direct knowledge the things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge. And he abandons by direct knowledge the things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And he develops by direct knowledge those things that should be developed by direct knowledge. And he realizes by direct knowledge those things that should be realized by direct knowledge. This is really important. It means the person is practicing correctly through knowledge and vision, which is the same thing as direct knowledge, okay? And that's how it takes you there. And when one knows and sees the mind as it actually is, and then these things uh, that should be realized by direct knowledge are totally completed. And this is what the Blessed One said and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the, in the Blessed One's words. So that one is in 149, the sec page uh, 11, 38, and 39. And then um, the only last part where it mentions it is in 151, section 3, or section 13. It's going through all the parts again. And serenity and insight are developed in me. And if by reviewing he knows the serenity and insight are not developed in me, then he should make an effort to develop them. But if by reviewing he knows thus serenity and insight are developed in me, then he can abide happy and glad, training day, training by night in wholesome states. So this is where, he, for us, it means stepping away from the practice in the formal sense and practicing it all day long. But the whole thing is, what we're after is living in as much of the cessation, the cessation of the suffering as possible. So I'll tell you what happened to this Buddha. The Buddha was built. I had another nun go with me and we ordered it. We explained to him what we wanted him to do. His father had been producing these, but it had stopped long ago. He's in his forties now. He's the one that's over this place that makes, it, makes them. I went back about a month and a half later and I saw the white one that they had created. It was just beautiful. Then something happened, Bonte came over. We had to do retreats. It sat there and it didn't get delivered. When I went back to pick it up, it wasn't there anymore. Instead, they had delivered this gold Buddha instead of the white Buddha. So I mean, what happened to it? No one would speak about it. Later on, I found out there was an upset because someone had come and said, what are you doing creating this Buddha? But they knew what it was. They knew that I was creating the third noble truth. So it's probably another subject, isn't it, for a wise cracker tour, tour of investigation to figure out. <laughs> but I don't know how we can ever figure it out. When they decided it was more important to stress to the world the suffering and then the cause and the Eightfold Path without talking really about the cessation being possible. And the impression that has happened by mixing these things up has come out to be from people that don't know what, what Buddhism actually is. The impression has been, we can be pretty pessimistic if we are only talking about suffering and the cause of the suffering. 
but we don't talk about the cessation of it very much. And then we stress Nibbana. And if we don't, we aren't living in a time when the attainments are happening around us as easily as they were before, then we have to make up stories to fill in the blanks for that. It gets very confusing, you know? But the fact is, if we straighten out what this four steps of right effort were, we all know what starts to begin to happen. If you practice it all the time, can you take it into life? Well, that's another problem. I, I cannot for the life of me figure out how it got started that meditation is only when you're having retreat and when you're sitting in a formal position alone at home and that's it. It's applying it into life and living it, using it all the time. So can we use the four steps of right effort in life? You bet you can, of course you can. You watch and you learn what the unwholesome states are. The unwholesome states are falling into when somebody starts yelling at you, all of a sudden you immediately, oh, here, here they go again. Oh, they're gonna do it to me again. Oh, it's gonna come down on me again. Here we go again. And you're, it's stuck in the past. This is all in the past, based on the past. This is wrong. Because you're supposed to be living here in the present that's moving like this. And you're staying in the present, in it, in it, in it, in it, in it, in it. <laughs> you see, you're supposed to be in it. And you practice this like you're living in a little boat and you're floating through and they happen to be sitting there. Don't fret about it. They're gonna be in the past in a few minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it takes, yeah? So your turn, feedback. What do we do about this? How can we get the Nobel Prize to build our center instead of this guy going and getting the Nobel Prize for saying that he just came up with neuroplasticity and changing habits? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that was uh, uh, very... Uh, apt uh, description of uh, right effort. So I was wondering, you know, instead of calling it uh, right effort, uh, uh, right practice is a much better way of describing the four steps. Or, uh, of course, harmonious practice is the term used by Bhante and you. But even right uh, practice would be so much better, you know, so much confusion of last 50 years because of this word effort. And, you know, trying to uh, struggle and put things uh, 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 with, a, with a lot of striving. So, uh, uh, why, why, why uh, uh, use the word effort at all? Does it, you know, in uh, Pali, the word uh, for effort, does it translate to practice better or? No, it's Vayama. Um... Yeah, that's a good angle. I should try and do more of that. I should try to go to um, Megda and ask her. She's one of the poly teachers. Um, yeah, so can Vayama be, uh, you know, Vayama as I understand I, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, common Hindi, there is also a word called Vayam. Yeah. Or Sanskrit. And Vayam means exercise. So it's uh, more like a right exercise rather than right effort. Now, Bhikkhu Bodhi has a, he's got a glossary in the back. I think Wyam is there. Let's look and see what he said. Um, you know, it's, I have to find the, the, <laughs> the hardest thing for the glossary for me is it's not A, B, C, D, E, F, G anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. You. Um, Let's see, uh, Ulysses, can you look, can you look in the, um, look at a poly dictionary online right now for me? In your okay. class, can you look in the poly dictionary for Wayama? And I try to find it in here. I thought it was here. Let's see. 
should be, of course, P and then B and then M. I knew that, yeah. Here, wait a minute. Uh, you need so, here we go. Yeah, no, see, this is the problem. <laughs> now, so his Vayama says effort. You see, Bharat, his, his, in his glossary, he put Vayama as effort. But you have to remember now, okay, Nanamoli wrote this Majjhima Nikaya, okay? And I don't know how much of the glossary, uh, you know, Bhikkhu Bodhi finished the work. Now, who decided on the definition uh, inside the um, glossary? I don't know, but I do know this, that Nanamoli really leaned heavily in the, in the case of the Vasudhi Maga for the verifiability. Bhikkhu Bodhi is like this. <laughs> He's willing to look in another place. Yeah, but... And there is another word also uh, in Pali, that is uh, viriya. So what is the difference between virya and vayama? No, virya is energy. Wait a second. Yeah, but that is also uh, translated as effort. Well, um, is it not be called as wise practice, vayama? Yeah, well, that would be, that's correct to say white practice, but where do we find that? And uh, where do we find that in a, uh, in a glossary, Sarma? That's the issue. So the, that when we start hunting for it, it must have been pushed around into being just effort. And you know, the thing about it is, it, it's the third or fourth definition for effort. It is effort, but it's a specific <laughs> type of effort that has four pieces. I have to get the what, uh, what, what do you think, uh, Sister Kema, about the word uh, endeavor, endeavor? We have to be careful about that. So effort word, that's a lot of endeavor. They'll go back and say, work harder, endeavor. Well, wait a second. I'll come back and we'll look in the glossary. Just one second. I mean, in the third word. Dissecting right effort. It's a wise oh, practice is correct as per Pali. Oh, no, that is correct. That is a practice. In the eightfold path, it is written as right effort. So, right effort is generally translated even by big uh, scholars as uh, striving hard. Forceful striving. Ah, that's okay. These are all happening. We are not having Sampajanya. That is the drawback with us. <laughs> yeah, that is right. <laughs> we are not in Sampajanya. <laughs> we are mindful. We are, we are in uh, Sati. That mindful also, it varies uh, in degrees at times only. We are not, 20, <laughs> we are not having 24 hours uh, perfect mindfulness is not there. Okay, let me say which one was it, Bharat, that you wanted me to look up? Endeavor? Endeavor or, or practice or exercise. Exercise. A exercise. Uh, too much effort. That's <laughs> 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 a frustrating thing about it. You, you know, it's a very frustrating thing. So um, endeavor. Okay, wait a second. Endeavor. Um, uh, endeavor is like a mission. Yeah, so the mission is to replace unwholesome with wholesome. Okay, to endeavor here, to endeavor is to attempt to strive to work at, to try one's hand at, to do one's best. Um, do one's as best. The undertakes. Then you get struggle, labor, essay. Yeah. A try or attempt, trial, effort, striving. Yeah. Well, try, that's pretty good. Endeavor. Actually, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh... The problem here is that semantics. Yeah, the problem is semantics. And the problem is. 
that whenever anybody has a question, uh, the those who are teaching vastly will go, oh, let's check the Vasudhi Maga, or according to the Vasudhi Maga, this would mean, or blah, 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 just like that. It's a systematic <laughs> thing that happens. And when we're caught in that, then you find something that works. It's not easy to... So well, in the beginning of this whole thing, I said to you guys, I was looking for a book, you know, to, to, to start from the beginning. And I thought, what about talking about the last 20 years of witnessing how this was all developing? How did the definition of mindfulness happen? How did the definition of meditation happen? How did delusion come to mean this, this uh, or, or the uh, idea of the Atta and Anatta refining that from self and no self to the consequences of believing a self. That's how that one happened. And the consequence, the consequence of believing in uh, no self or self, where does it lead? So by using deductive reasoning, keeping this thing going like that, and uh, you know, what is it Dr. Spock's uh, or Mr. Spock's remarks about um, when, um, See. When you when you eliminate when you eliminate what is possible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, it must be the truth. <laughs> that was from Sherlock Holmes, and uh, now we all think today it was from Doctor Spock in Star Trek. No, it was from Sherlock Holmes. And so here we are. We're trying to. What is the? What is the? We played the game this way. What is the one word I can use for you as an audience in front of me, where the majority of the people in the room are probably going to get what we're trying to say? And this is the dilemma of communication, isn't it? <laughs> you know, Barat knows what he wants to say, and he's very good at this. And he he's been around long enough and worked with enough people. And then he decides to say what he means. But when he sees, if he sees us, that's a good thing. He can tell maybe if we're listening, did we hear what he said, but did we know what he meant? <laughs> so all these little components are in this communication thing that I never thought about until I was in Buddhism. And uh, yeah, it's very difficult with generation gaps going on and the, the vastness of the different traditions and practices and everything, the reasons people come to meditation is another discussion. Um, if we were to sit here and just list everything that we know about people coming to, to meditate, why they come for what, we would see this vast field of, of reasons for people to come and meditate that are different from people coming to try to figure all this out, yeah? So I still want to, my idea with this Buddha, when, he, when this Buddha was produced, was to actually get the person who was building this Buddha to understand that if we started a movement, an actual movement across Buddhism of having a Buddha that was actually teaching uh, the, the third noble truth. Wouldn't it be spectacular if we made thousands of them and everybody ordered one, <laughs> you know? But I don't know uh, why it never happened. Why wouldn't we get thrilled about the idea it makes it easier for the person who works as a customer service representative at a Walmart, makes her life easier when she figures out how to reduce her suffering reduce it closer and closer to this cessation by understanding how it works. And we don't talk about that. Is it, is it, because, is it because we're the same as the newspapers? <laughs> we have to, you know, uh, there was a place that was a really nice place to live and, and uh, in, in Midwest one time and this, they set up the the uh, happy newspaper, well, <laughs> happy newspaper got up to 146,000 followers. And then world newspaper came in, made an offer you could not refuse and they sold the paper. Well, it was gone. And then we were back to how many murders, how many rapes, how many bad things, how many missiles are about to blow up, how many bombs went off last week, how many fire, that's all that was there. So if that's where people's mindset, how do we shift? Shift. <laughs> shift to the light you know we have to get ourselves to shift a little bit do you have any other comments i think that's a good one though about the the weary uh, um 
Yeah. Um, in terms in terms of the image of the Buddha that you have behind, I uh, just wanted to mention that the, um, at the Chuan Yin Monastery over here in New York, the one that they have in the Great Hall, which is like the largest in the Western Hemisphere, has a, an image of the Buddha actually teaching, like he's taking his hand to say, number one, um, I, I'll find the picture and send it to you. Uh, but well, the, he's actually... One, two, three, four, like that. They have four Buddhas. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, there is one gi um, gigantic Buddha in the, in the, in the big hall. Yeah, and there there are several pictures of the of other pictures of the Buddha doing the same thing, like using his hands to point out what you know what what is he teaching. But the the one in the main hall is is doing something like this, like he's just like number one. Here this we go. What this is coming from, so you understand, is Bhante's teacher was a uh, um, most venerable Usilananda. He's passed away in two thousand and five, and his father was a very famous. Uh, into the sculptures of the Buddhists and his family goes back into studying them and everything. And he's the one that taught Bhante, who taught me that these four pieces, these are the four noble truths. And we start, you know, like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then the fourth one, okay? Or we start by this, this original mantra. Now there's the tradition in Tibet have turned it into 7,000 different uh, uh, of these, of these, not mantras, but 7,000 different mudras, I'm sorry, mudras, positions of the hands to be different things, you see? But the original one was like this, and then like this, and then like this, like that, okay? And the Thais had some older statues in Kansas City in their temple, in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and they had them there. They had four of them. And the one who was teaching in the teaching room was teaching the uh, the third noble truth. Yeah. So, and there's one that did it in the airport. Which airport is it? Is it Indonesia? I, no, no. It's not Indonesia. I think it's Malaysian airport. Great big hands up here on the wall as you're going down the stairs to where you check in with your visas, as you're going down in receiving people. Delhi airport. Yeah. Which one? Delhi airport. Uh huh. And it has it like this. And then it has it like that. And then it has it like that. And then it has it like that. Or like this. The last one I think is like that. Great big sculptures of them. I thought that was wonderful. I thought, look at that. The third one is there. <laughs> I thought it was great. I will. I will. I'm, we're almost done. Okay. Thank you. So the biggest problem we have in may having, I may I yeah. ask you mm -hmm. the yeah. right effort is followed by right intention and right speech, right action, right livelihood, all this put together, it is called the wise. Uh, uh what we have called that particular word wise practice yeah yes so yeah. right effort again is a is only initiation that is why then only we will develop and mind should not have should not control with with control without control only all these to be gained that is why endeavor is not a correct word i feel no, no, right endeavor. Well, okay, right effort. You have to understand right effort has four steps that you must do them. Mm -hmm. So as an endeavor in your practice, that would mean something that you do in your practice. You have to functionally do it and train your mind to do it automatically. Right effort, we know now that right effort has recognized the unwholesome state in your mind. It's okay. Um and then release the unwholesome state, bring up the wholesome state and keep the wholesome state going and make more like them, more like that state occurring in your mind. That's what you want to learn to do. Now you do use your mind Sarma until it becomes automatic and it surprises you when it becomes automatic, it turns into right striving. See? It is final result. 
yeah, it turns into right okay. striving. Right striving happens not because you decide that right striving is going to happen. This is the catch. You have to take the volition to practice the steps of right effort uh, continually, continually, continually. And then in your life, all of a sudden, it happens without you asking it to happen. Have you? Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that this, this, that is the, um, the crux is for most people who come into meditation late or from other traditions, you know, like uh, pe people are expecting a result already without the understanding of the right effort. I think that's really where it's at. Yes. And, and, I agree. and the, thing, the thing to understand is that the right effort has to be done, you know, on a regular basis, not only because of the results, which might be eventually, you know, getting the the, um, the fruition or whatever that comes with the right effort, but because it's also improving your life, like your life is, is going to be better as a result. If you are expecting the fruition only, then you're skipping what's really important, which is like how does that affect you in real life? So um, I, I have these conversations with myself often, <laughs> but I also have them with other people. And, and, uh, and, and again, because, you know, there's a, Especially in the Western in the Western world where I come from, oh, yeah. uh, people are expecting a mystical experience, you know. And we have had them. A lot of people have mystical experiences, and and you know, and they they want to have answers to those myst mystical experiences. But the mystical experience is, I finding it to be meaningless without the right effort, which means without the right striving, without how that actually operates in real in in real day to day. Um, See, this uh, is issue the issue i think that i see at the difference is that um we're asking you we're trying to get across to you that we're teaching you something to put into life and take away from the the retreat center and start living it all the time while you're driving while you're traveling every time all, all the all everywhere we had delightful experience with a student that came to meditation in, in the Damasuka one time and called us from California after he drove home from Missouri. And he said, you know, when I left here, I started practicing in the car. And he realized everything changed. The way that he checked into a motel, the way he dealt with people, the way he behaved with people in a restaurant, just everything, he was talking about it. That's what we're looking for if we're looking for changing the world. We can't change the world by continuing to go to workshops and conferences and then just saying, we're going to change the world. It's just not, in, it's just insignificant. We've reached a limit with it and, and it doesn't seem to work, you know? And I also think that, you know, uh, by practicing saying it over and over, by practicing, you know, doing it over and over and over, whenever we fall off the wagon, which we might fall off the wagon from time to time, Sure. You, uh, there is there is a method or there is a path there is a recipe that you can follow and then you know that you can find your center again that's how yeah, at you least you gotta forgive yourself and have a good giggle <laughs> you have to have uh, that's where you're one of the things monty said um to us a couple years into the thing was you know how, someone would say how do you know if you're progressing and the question is what is the state of your sense of humor <laughs> Can you, are you laughing at yourself yet? Because you have people come in who I'm going to do this, you know, and they're so stern and they're going to make it happen. And it's a lot of work to, to keep saying it again and again, like, oh, you know, don't try to make this happen. That's why I came up with the little thing about what if I challenge you this week to attempt, now I said attempt true, but attempt to experience an experience of no experience. And you tell me what happened. You see, <laughs> experience and experience of no experience. And what do you mean by that? Well, the, the English is the second language person is like swimming to stay on the surface when you're saying, I want you to experience, which is a verb and experience, which is a noun of no experience, which is an adjective, it's simple. <laughs> And I didn't realize when I said it the first time, I didn't realize I was doing that to you. Okay, but the huge part of understanding anatta 
is I have to get out of the way. I have to give it up because the Atta is wanting to make it happen personally. And then the person just starts to move down the path, they start to move. But as long as they want it, even, you know, in, in the case of some, uh, somebody was saying, I'm practicing, uh, what is it? I'm practicing um, determinations, okay? Um, and the question was, um, if I say I, the, the, the determination has to be, you have to learn the determination has to be stated a very particular way. Otherwise it fails. And I used to laugh at him and I used to try all the alternatives and they just don't work. Like I will sit this long or I want to sit in the first jhana today or um, I will, uh, there was a bunch of them. I wrote them all down and I tried, none of them worked. And as soon as I did it the right way, it worked just like that. I will sit no higher than. See, when I say I will sit no higher than, I'm still leaving it up to mind. I'm not invading the territory. I'm not trying to push him out of the way and say anything else as if he was, or he, the he, she, whoever it is, was making this everything. I don't know what was going on. But when I say it, I will sit no higher than infinite space, that still leaves it wide open. I could get there, maybe I won't get there, you see? but I won't go any higher. Maybe I won't go any higher, maybe. And it not, the way I kept track of it, he was right. About 95% of the time, it's going to work correctly. Unless you had some desire tucked in here really strong, you know, then it's going to work fine. But you have to step out of the way and allow it to work. We're not used to doing that. We are not used to doing that. We are caught in a complex, competitive, magnificently complicated, simple world. <laughs> That's what we got. And we, and the more we go with this, uh, I, I was, uh, what was I doing last night? I, for some reason, you know, my daughter had a baby. Well, I know why she had a baby, but you know, <laughs> whoops, where's my foot? Put it in again. <laughs> no. I'm just trying to say she just had a baby. So I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how much it would cost for this little child to go to Waldorf school because Waldorf schools are really neat. They're really neat places, you know? And I thought, how much could it cost to go to a Waldorf? So I'm reading about the Waldorf school and such. And um, as I'm reading it, they're saying the Waldorf school is different from the Montessori school and the Waldorf school really pushes no technology in the classroom at all, none. And they do this for the first, um, up until a certain age and then they allow some of it, but Montessori takes a different look on it. So if you're wanting your child from the time they're born to get involved in the tech world, you don't wanna send them to, uh, you know, maybe send them to Waldorf or, or even Montessori for that reason. But it, this, was, this was interesting. Why do you wanna get the person so busy in their mind? See, we're living in this world I don't know if I told you guys, but I visited a family once and the, par the parents had died and the uh, grandparents were raising the two children and the one was a teenager, uh, she was in her twenties and the younger one was 15 or 16 years old, a boy. And he had reached a state of, uh, he, of gaming on the computer. And this gaming, I have, I knew that it was addictive. I knew that it's causing a problem, but I never saw a case this difficult in my life. And she sat there one night while I was there for two nights. The second night she sat up with me and the, and the grandmother said, what can we do? I said, I don't know what to tell you. The school sent him home, said they don't want him anymore. And the, uh, the, the counselor said, I can't deal with it. I can't do anything for you, nothing. And the child is at the point where if you ask him not to play, he won't eat, he won't sleep. If you take it away from him, he'll threaten to commit suicide if you take away the gaming, the gaming system. He's totally, completely addicted to this gaming thing. What do you do? Look at where we are in our development as human beings. Look at what we've done. 
And then you, you, then I go to this Montessori thing and this Waldorf thing. They say for a young child, they should only be allowed on the screen for an hour a day. Oh my gosh, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't even fathom it while I sit here in the 10th hour. <laughs> you know, at least I'm sane enough to get up and take a walk a few times, but I end up sitting far too much you know, trying to do what I'm doing because I don't go out. This is my, my, this is my honeycomb or my, my beehive. You know, I'm just here. The whole thing is here. So I don't know what we, we, we are living in this strange pace, but coming back to right effort, it helps us to understand that one of the secrets the Buddha found in the right effort was to, he was, he was, um, he was seeing the distraction and the moment he realized now we're saying see it but also feel it the tension rising first then do it take the steps then to release from it we're trying to teach you the symptoms this is where we go one step further i was actually trying to um, figure out the difference of what we've done and where it stopped here and what's different over here it's just to me like going to the next coach in riding my bike long distance from uh the 10 speed bike to the 21 speed bike um coach that's all this seems like to me we haven't thrown anything anyone has done away but they get very protective of uh, this is the thing where everyone has to live in a group we have to belong to a group we have to label ourselves all of that stuff and if we're labeled this way then we're not going to trust looking at anything else so we've we've discarded possibilities and uh, to me it doesn't make sense because I was in Washington DC too long <laughs> and everything was based on progress progress progressing you know, and achieving one step more to discover, to discover, to discover, questioning all, everything, absolutely everything, what I was involved in. And now I'm in a place where they don't want to question anything. And immediately the idea is it must be threatening what I'm doing and saying, I can't have this anymore. Well, that's another discussion we should have because the four steps of right effort can be used in breathing meditation and improve your breathing meditation, can't it? Totally and completely. And does it take away your breathing meditation for you to just leave that alone and look at, at uh, meta only? And I got this image in my head, my this image in my head of how to explain this to someone. And I came up with this and I'll leave you with this because it's kind of funny. <laughs> you know, I rollerbladed a lot in my 50s, a lot, long distance rollerblading, but I also rode bicycles. But when I was looking at this problem of not being willing to take your rollerblades off when you want to learn to ride a bicycle long distance instead. So what would it have been like if I had kept refused to take my rollerblades off and I tried to get on the bicycle and pedal with the rollerblades on my feet to learn to practice the bicycle. This is the dilemma the Buddha had, believe it or not, <laughs> he did. Because if they were practicing this way and refused to give that up when they examine this way, they cannot have this pure experience unless they take off the rollerblades and put them down and climb on the bike and start to pedal the bike to find out what it's like to pedal a bike and that's where I was and I didn't know how to express it to the person without the person immediately turning around and and saying um I can't I cannot do this because I would be losing everything I've ever done before if I do this and that's just not the case at all not the case and this this all the things we're showing you the right effort, the right striving, the 37 requisites, as we examine the 37 requisites, we're all involved with the breathing meditation, all of them. So the test is, uh, I guess, if you don't want to do the method, don't do it. But when you're doing the breathing, try to see what happens. This is what initially Bhante was getting other monks to try. And 
other people to try. Just try to see what happens when the distraction comes instead of treating it the normal way, just let it go, relax, smile, and come back and keep going with your breathing meditation. This isn't destroying your breathing meditation. You'll probably find out each time you go a little deeper, a little deeper each time, see? When you relax, each time you relax, you go deeper. There is another couple problems with that too, because of you have to be able to consider something else about your object of meditation than the way some people think about it. It's true. That's just a simple thing. What happens if you don't um, glue your mind to the breath or glue your mind to the arising and falling of the, uh, of the, the, um, the diaphragm and the, and the, you know, feeling the air on the upper lip or the nostril tip. What if you don't concentrate on that because the misunderstanding is that that object was simply a returning point to know you were still there okay fine no you're there it's fine right but all the things that i'm showing people can be applied to breathing and nobody's saying that we're recruiting people it's not that we're recruiting people we're just trying to to establish a way to teach people there's an alternative way to reach path and move down more directly, just as it's described in the suttas. And that's what's fun to discover that's real. Okay. So see all your shining faces. So what do you think, Ardika? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm here. I'm listening. Stay. <laughs> okay. So everybody okay with this? Sarah, how are you doing? You okay? Yes. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you like this because I was really trying to figure it out, you know, and I thought this is really good. We're just going to use this tonight, you know, and do this, you know, so you can see how going into the whole thing and trying to figure out what was said in there and what did it really mean? Yeah. And then it's up to you with direct knowledge what to do. Yeah. Okay. I do have one um, practical question from Hugh. He's had to go. Yep, okay. uh, he, he's reminded um, that you did a presentation in Sri Lanka on the neurocognitive science and why the Buddha should be considered the first neurocognitive scientist. And he wonders if you might be able to share that. He remembers it as being really good. At the time I did that, I can, yeah, you know, we could share that. If the people are interested in that, y'all need to let me know, but it's, it's not difficult to do this. It's really not because what I did, I only remember I only had 30 minutes. <laughs> the challenge i only had 30 minutes so i had to whip them through this i did it with a powerpoint presentation and i took them through the whole entire thing see but i emphasized the six uh the six parts of the dependent origination that we use in order to see clearly the pieces that have to be identified which is the difference between feeling and emotion okay but also this particular, at that time, at that time, the only research I was biting on, I, that I was basing the whole thing on, was there was a research um, project by three guys, I think, uh, up in Northeast of the United States. And they did this on, um, they did it on, um, oh, what did they do it on? Gosh. They, they did it on, um, Oh, I'm, I just had this wonderful senior moment again. I love these things. <laughs> it just, <phew! laughs> I was just about to say it. The, they, they did their research only based on um, one thing. And, and she came, and then this woman who was a psychologist read their research and she came rushing back and she said, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's look at this. Um, if you change this, 
uh, you, you also can change a behavioral pattern. So they were hooking it to one thing. And this is, this is wonderful stuff. This is the synchronicity of research with the birth of the internet. So you don't have so much of a disaster of a Russian and a European and an American. You never get to see each other who are working on the same thing anymore. You get more connectedness. And this was a wonderful case of that. And these three guys had found one point, but she, she says, but let's look at this. The thing is, if you, do, if you are doing that, let's see what happens if you do one step more or you, you, let's run the research again and not just base it on the smile. I think it was something to do with the smile, not just base it on the smile, but let's prove that you could change a behavior pattern. Now from this research, it's the early Brack, early research, okay? That was in, this was in 2012, okay? Then after that comes the birth of neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity trickles in, but they probably got tripped off by these little things that these other people did underneath to get to the point of neuro having a neurologist go and say, well, let's take another look at what's happening to the neural pathways in the brain when this guy's angry, okay? And, and then um, we t we, can we see a difference? And what they found was in conjunction if I'm not mistaken, the neuroplasticity happened on the development line for the MRIs. The FRMI happened, okay? And the FRMI you can do more often than the MRI, okay? And they use this for examining behavioral modification techniques, you see? Okay, and this all developed simultaneously with the new set of cameras that came into the MRI field. And all of a sudden they could see so much more in the brain. They could see the little strands. It wasn't just a picture of all these things looking like this and connected like crosswise pieces like this. All of a sudden you could see like little tiny hairs sticking up from the brain. And you know what? That guy who was angry, he had a thick one sticking up instead of a thin hair-like one. And that was his anger pathway. And she maintained that you could change it. We had to look and see if you could change it. And that's where you do have the potential to change a new, a neural, a, a new neural development of new neural pathways in the brain was real. So what's the big deal about all this was the fact that even 28 years ago, now if I count backwards, I think 30 years maybe, no one accepted that these uh, things could change once you were an adult, you were fixed in time. Even psychiatrists were basing this on these things can't change, person is damaged and they're gonna stay that way, they can never change. So to me, after working in advocacy and mental health, I was there like, oh my God, you're saying there's hope. So this whole discovery of the idea that neural pathways are not locked in place, that if he was, changing to loving kindness every day and going to loving kindness and compassion every day again 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 his anger pathway if he did that instead of the anger would dry up and crack and fall off this was her theory so then they went two months and took pictures two months later and then they saw that the neural pathway was all shriveled up and dried out and then they saw this new tiny little hair starting to grow thing that was a new pathway of that's the hope highway, <laughs> that's what I called it, the hope highway. So to me, it was like having tears in my eyes to think the people that I had worked with before believed they were caught in these labeled situations of behavior. Now, how far can we go with this? Nobody knows, okay, yet, but they will. And the interesting part is, can it go as far as a bipolar disorder that's a one to five, say, can it flip away and just disappear if the bipolar disorder was set off by erratic uh, uh, trauma or um, you know, sudden trauma? From, we know from 18 years old, I think it is 18 years old and older, that when this hits suddenly, okay, like it did with me, it hit suddenly. And I was labeled at first bipolar, which was a very tragic thing because you can't change your hospital records. <laughs> and then I re reduced to cyclothymia afterwards, which is between zero and one, which is non-descriptive and not dangerous, you see. But 
I was in the one to five bracket, like one or two at first. Six people died in 10 months time. I couldn't handle it. I collapsed, I folded up. Uh, on the exit interview, all I can tell you about on the exit interview from the hospital after 28 days, you know, of going out of the hospital, I can remember the discussion with him. I, I, only one question. Do you want to tell me what happened? <laughs> so I asked him in the end. And I love Dr. Fisher. He was great. I was blessed by gods or whatever that this man was my psychiatrist at the time. And, you know, he looked at me and he went like this and he said, okay, you're in a house and you just threw the breaker switch off for the whole entire thing. That's what happened to you. And it was, that's what happened to me. And when I woke up the next morning, when I, I drove there and parked in the driveway and checked myself in, <laughs> it was very funny. And the next morning I wake up and the nurse says, I have to get up and walk to get breakfast. I said, I can't, I don't think I wanna sleep the rest of the day. They let me sleep the rest of the day, okay? but. When I got up to walk the first time, I couldn't. The walking wasn't there very well. I could use the banisters in the hallway to get to the room and cross the hall with a nurse and sit down to eat and go back to my room. That was the universe at that point in the beginning. It was a complete, utter collapse. And the way to describe this to someone, very difficult for you to understand. You're looking at color and you see color in a painting. For me, I didn't see any color in the painting for 38 days. Then suddenly I started to see color again. And for many years, I thought I was insane. And someone in a, in a support group was talking and then they all agreed they had only seen grays and tans and browns and light blacks and different color blacks, no color at all. I remember, I remember when I look back during the first um, 20 days, I got to go on the bus once to the mall and walk around with another person. I didn't want to be around people at all, not at all. And when I went, I came back and they gave me a very high grade. <laughs> I said, what's this grade for? It's a very high grade because I bought the brightest pink bedroom slippers I could find. That was it, really bright pink bedroom slippers that you just slip on these real cheap ones you know and they thought that was miraculous when I went back to my house uh, after when I went back to where I was living okay I looked in the closet and I realized he's right I really did go off the deep end I had discarded every piece of color out of my closet there was nothing but grays and browns and blacks and dark blues in my closet, solid colors, no, nothing, no patterns at all. So I took all my clothes, I threw them out and went to the Goodwill shop and bought new clothes, as much color as I could find. But it took a long time to come back out of that situation. And, but where I came back out of that situation, how did I come back out of a situation? was by uh, making a decision to help other people understand that this can happen to anyone, you see? And then suddenly what happened, this is probably the next book, it should be, <laughs> you know, probably what happened was this man from the, um, the TV station, he came to talk to me because I was working with helping other people with depressive disorders at that point. And he said, what makes you do this work? I had to pause. And then I went and got him some coffee and brought it back. And I said, I think I'm doing it because when I'm doing this, I don't have any thoughts at all about my problems, none whatsoever. My world is gone and I can help other people. It's an incredible relief to come back and to be able to work with other people, you know, just to have had the experience of going through that system like that. There is more to the story than that. But, but the whole thing was what really happened is that you are completely turned off. You can't fathom it. And then you get to throw one switch back on and maybe another. To cop, top the whole thing off, it was not all a pleasant ride in the hospital, okay? Because they gave me a drug. They were supposed to monitor me very closely. I had a really bad reaction, caused a stroke in 24 hours. I got the stroke when I was sleeping. It took me two and a half years to prove that the stroke had happened. And eventually they came out with testing that they can give you now that can, I, can 
uh, bring out whether the person ever had a stroke, this testing, it's like eight hours long, it's just terrible. But you can do this form of testing now. But that wasn't developed at that point, you see. And those nurses just used to sit down there at that nurse's wing and just party and just party like crazy and never pay any attention to any of us in the rooms, you see. And I didn't know what happened. The next morning I got up, I could barely speak. And then I had to crawl all the way back from this whole thing. Uh, my walking wasn't damaged, but my brain was just not there. And I had to learn a lot of things again. That's what made me make the decision uh, in watching how some of the different ways that people were treated, the different ways that people were treated um, on the, on the, um, the different ways that the people were treated in the ward by the different sets of psychiatrists is what made me want to do advocacy work. I didn't plan on doing advocacy work, but I was withdrawn when it came out. Totally withdrawn. You you guys meet me out again. <laughs> but I'm I'm understanding what happened now. They never told me for years. No one ever touched the subjects that we're talking about. So this whole thing about why get involved with it and how it was put out that he was the father of the whole thing. He's the only one that ever has anything out there that I know of that could explain to a person what happened to me. And by learning dependent origination, I understood totally and completely what happened to me. And then the, the part that the Buddha makes very clear in 128, if you go to 128 in the last paragraph, he makes it clear that all of the things that he discussed with those monks, the one solution for everything, every one of them, I understood that the, let's just say that the distraction or the, um, the hindrance is an imperfection of the mind. And I abandoned the imperfection. I abandoned whatever it was, the imperfection of the mind. That's how we got free of it, okay? In right effort, he emphasizes again how you, um, you replace it with what you need to have in order to change. You can't change without that. So what she was going to um, do this big profound talk on at the time that I did that, uh, proving that he was the father of neuro, uh, the, um, I would say cognitive psychology, but not really neurocognitive science, but it led to the neurocognitive science. The trail, the path of this whole thing is cognitive psychology and then neurocognitive, uh, neurocognitive science and, and neuroscience taking off. And the projection for this whole thing is psychology departments will disappear on campuses and fall under the neuro, uh, neurocognitive science or neuroscience department and neurocognitive psychology will sit within it that eventually neurocognitive psychology will overtake the psychiatry and psychology. That's the projection for, for um, you know, uh, psychoanalysts and for psychologists for the for the psychiatrist they're going through a medical i don't know whether they'll 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 or they'll stay separate i don't know what they'll do <laughs> i don't know because the prop the problem quite frankly the problem with the psychiatry end of it the psychiatrist can can ish can prescribe the drugs okay and the problem in our country is the drug the drug system has overtaken the medical schools now and so the doctors who go through the medical schools don't get diagnostics. You think they don't have Ayurvedic or home homeopathic or naturopathic or anything like that. They don't have anything anymore except the physician's desk reference on their desk. So that book is like, is like this book for Majima Nikaya and another one about this wife sitting on top of it. And the two years they used to have in diagnostics has been reduced to maybe six months to a year of learning how to read that book. And it's set up symptom, drug, symptom, drug, symptom, drug. And if we don't have a drug for a symptom, let's invent one and sell it to you. And if at all possibility, unfortunately, if there's any possibility of it, we'd like to emphasize you get them on the ones they can stay on for life. 
Don't let them investigate anything else. Get them on the one that can stay on for life. Now, this is a bad trip, okay? Because in mental health, there's a group of stabilization drugs that you get at the front door and you have to have those drugs. You can't fight against those. This is a big issue. You have to have those when something initially happens to stabilize you enough to be able to hear and compute and understand if someone were to teach you what I was teaching you or anything else. You have to be able to do that, okay? It's, it's the drugs like giving lithium to someone to stabilize the ups and downs, but never checking in on them every six weeks or whatever it is for the blood test to be done. And the doctors don't do that, then we can get in real trouble here because lithium, which works so well for a period of time, was, was working to take it, it, when you have, apparently when you have a really traumatic thing happen, the lithium productive system goes and it doesn't wake up again. But many of those uh, consumers are never told the lithium was being produced in their body originally. There is a chance it can come back. In my case, I was very lucky. It came back, it turned back on. Because I maintained you can't label me that way. My argument was you can't label me that way without knowing who I am, first of all. Now I was there, remember, 28 days. The average person is in there now four to five days and kicked out of the hospital. So the recidivism of coming back and in and out and in and out starts almost immediately. Why? Because it takes two weeks average time to adjust to a drug intake and know whether it's gonna work for a person or not. So if you send the person home, how do you keep track of everybody? This is a, very, a really tough situation. And how serious is this whole thing in mental health? Well, it's as serious as cancer and heart disease. That's how serious it is. And how impressive should it be for the governments? Well, if, you, if I were to tell you the percentages you're losing on the gross national product due to mental health, you would just be aghast. And now with COVID, it's a tremendous, tremendous thing that everybody's up against. I only, I don't wanna know a lot about it anymore, you know, but I peeked at some of the statistics at home and the suicide rates are not just up for young people. They're all over, over the sky into the firmament with the young people. But the older people who have been locked up and not even allowed to see their families, it's the biggest tragedy in the world's history as far as mental health is concerned that I can, I can even fathom. This is worse than post-World War II. That's what someone told me, worse. Because it encompasses all these different countries with all these different levels of development and how much cooperation we have is very limited. How much are you actually communicating with each other? It's, it's, it's just devastating. But for me back then, the secret for me to crawl out from under the floor with the whole thing when I came around, two things. One is the Native Americans. <laughs> The medicine man of one of the tribes offered to let me sit in his hut and paste together the things he had cut out that he's going to show for close to about two months time. And I was isolated in the cabin living by myself and doing this, listening to him tell me about life and tell me about people and how everything works and getting me to talk about very few things. but letting me do things with my hands. I wanted to do things with my hands all the time. When I feel my heart hurts when I come to a country who might not have a lot of places for people with, with mental breakdowns to go in order to work with their hands, doing simple things to come back to the world. It's a shortage here, I think, you know? It's a shortage here. The agencies that we need to help the elderly, to help the teenagers, to help everything. I have this feeling there is this shortage of this here. Whereas at home, certain things that I would help people with, I, I knew where to go. I knew if I needed, the person definitely needed an intervention, I could go to an agency to ask for assistance to make it happen. Here, I have no avenues to help people when that happens. It's a great tragedy. 
But the young people, the, the picture last week on the internet, I just wanted to cry. I don't have much tears left for the world anymore, but I, I, it made me feel like I was really close. I could have just wept when this little girl in about seventh grade was told by her mother who just held up you know, a sign like this and, and she said, read this. And it says, you're going back to school. And she started shaking all over and started weeping and crying out loud with her mom and grabbed her and just wept and wept and wept. That's how much stress she was carrying because she was sent away from school, not allowed to be in school. That's what happened. We cannot do this as a human being, a group of humans. We're not, we're not equipped to do what we're trying to do as far as lockdowns are concerned. We never bargained for all the little effects of this thing, for the elderly, for the, the person who's living alone. Just, it's endless. We never bargained for it. Apparently in America and Britain and Germany, as well as in India or in Bhutan or anywhere else, no one bargained for this, you see? So we, we have a lot to deal with in, as far as mental health is concerned. Um, the four steps of right effort, if I had known them when I was 16 years old, just the four steps of right effort, ah, my whole life could have been better. But no one would offer me that. You sit and pray and ask God to fix it. And if you have a question about death and dying, you ask the minister and he tells you, you came from dust and you're going back to dust and that's that. But there was nothing else to tell me. And I'm there, look, I can handle that with one person, maybe the second, maybe the third. But when you go up to like six or eight people and they're all just dropping like flies and some in painful ways, some very quickly, but in tragedies and trauma and everything, I can take it. I just couldn't take it. I don't think anybody should have to take it. I think that the four steps of right striving and right effort need to come out of Buddhism and go into all psychology in every high school before college. They need to be mandatory in health class. I have no excuse for ignoring the brain. I would like very much to get a hold of the books that are being used in high schools in the United States today and see what they learn in health class. If I didn't faint out of shock because I didn't know all the letters and abbreviations for everything, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know, a lot of things I don't know. Um, but um, basically, they tell you about your stomach and about your heart and about your breasts and about puberty and this and that and the other. Why don't they tell you about your head? Why don't they tell you anything? Why is it that we just exist from here down? Why, <laughs> you know? Like, here I go, I'm gonna do, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna talk to you like this from now on because I'm not here, I don't exist. <laughs> Can you imagine? This doesn't, and yet everything is here at the control room. Do you, look, watch, if I pull this up, oops, I can't catch it. There's a little window under here. You can look inside, you see those guys inside? I should paint them over They're all running the controls of your body and everything else. They're inside your brain. And it all starts here. So why aren't we talking about it? That's the point. So with that, I will leave you with, uh, let's see, the good news. The good news is that the puppy has not done anything on the floor in about a half an hour. <laughs> and uh, anybody knows, anybody who wants a puppy, because I have the greatest little puppy now and she's really trained, but I won't give her to anybody who doesn't have a backyard. They need, she needs a back. She will cry every time she has to do anything. I promise you, she will cry and she will tell you she wants to go to the door and I never make it in time. But if I let her out, we know that the big dog at the bottom killed the other puppies and that the dog will just run up and grab her for breakfast. So I can't let her out because there's no gate. So we're trying to get the gate put in. Even then, I only have like six foot wide, <laughs> a six foot wide strip, you know, in front of the door or maybe eight feet and then 20 feet long. And I don't really know what to do except find her a home. I mean, 
let's be reasonable. The funny part of this is you're looking at a nun. I'm supposed to be like a bird. You know, they fly, they, they go places. <laughs> so I'm not supposed to be here. What if I have to go to, to Barat and, and uh, you know, to Peral? <laughs> what if I have to go uh, to Washim or here or there? I don't need a puppy right now. I, I love her to death, but uh, she hasn't got a tick. She hasn't got a worm. She hasn't got anything on her. <laughs> She's clean as a whistle and sweet as an angel until. <laughs> so that's the story of life right now. So I want you all to smile and I'm going to let you go now. We went far too long. And uh, just remember, things can change. Nothing has to stay the same. Get in your little car and keep staying in the present time. That is the trick to the whole thing. Okay? Say a prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all may beings. Share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of Mars. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.